Amen. I feel good this morning, Jerry. I feel good. I feel good. I feel good. Because I realized God didn't have to do it. Like I said, it was just so many. If we go home and read the obituary, just listen at the TV, there's so many that didn't even get up this morning. But here we are in the house of worship one more time. You know, a lot of people don't come to church till on Sunday, and then a lot of them didn't even come on Sunday. But here we are, just two or three gathered in his name. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. To thank you, Jesus, because we know you didn't have to do it. Amen. But I have just a, a little short word for you this morning. Y'all pray for me. There's a lot going on, but I'm not making no excuses for nothing. I'm just glad to be here. But if you have your Bible, I ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 26, verse 69 through 75. Matthew 26, verse 69 through 75. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. Grace and loving God, we thank you once again, Father God, for the opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk, Father God, to elaborate on your word, Father God. But, Father God, I can't do it without you. So I ask you just to take control of Charles. Remove Charles, Father God. Speak through me to your people. They may hear a word from heaven. We'll take it out to this dying, wicked world and tell them about a living, risen Savior who died out on you on the cross, Father God, who was buried. But on that third day, got up with all power, not some power, all power, heaven and earth in his hand. We thank and we love you. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. Matthew 26, verse 69 through 75, reading from the King James Version. Now, Peter said without in the palace, and a dancer came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou said. And he was gone, and when he was gone and into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by, and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speak bewareth thee. And then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. Verse 75 says, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Just for a few minutes, I'd like to talk to you from the topic. A look at denying Christ. A look at denying Christ. In other words, don't give up. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad you think it is, don't give up and don't deny Christ. But I want to ask you a question. Have you all been in a situation in which things were going pretty good and then you did something to mess up the whole thing? You find yourself in a jam and you don't know exactly what to do. But has there ever been a time in your life in which you were sure that you could do something. You intended to do it. You started doing it. And then you found out it was more difficult than you thought it would be. One thing we all have in common, my sister and brother, is the ability to mess up a good situation. <laughs> and the ability to think that we are stronger than we really are. When we look at the word of God, we find that God is real and talking with us about real life situations and how we can mess up the good plan God has for our lives. When we do, 
we find ourselves wanting to just give up then. But the good news of the gospel is that even when we blow it, God has a plan for our life. But my brothers and sisters, I'm amazed at how God, how he wants to use people to recognize they do not deserve to be used. God just does not seem to give up on us, even though God knows the real deal about us. When we hear of Abraham and we hear of Sarah, we think of these people who walked so close to God that they never made any mistakes. When Abraham was a young man in his, in his 70s, uh -huh. see, that's a young man. That's where I am. I'm in my 70s. Or <laughs> oh, his early 80s. Uh -huh. God had told him he was going to have a son. Yeah. After about 10 to 15 years of trying to get pregnant, when Abraham was in his 80s, and Say was in her 70s, they thought they needed to try a new method. Say came up with the idea that she, she must be at fault. It must be her fault. So she told Abraham, she said, I'm going to give you my servant, Hagar, uh -huh. so that you can have sex with her. She will get pregnant, and then we'll raise the child as our own. This must be what God intended to happen. Now, Hagar was about to become the most important of all women in this clan of people. She is about to get special uh, top-notch treatment with everything going for her. Nothing is going to be spurred on her. But the moment she finds out that she is pregnant, she started hating on Sarah and putting her down, talking about her. Not only this, when her son grows up, she passes the attitude on down to him. <laughs> you know how our kids take on our attitude. Not only this, when her own son grows up, her attitude, his attitude is bad. When Sarah does get pregnant at the age of 90, in the way God intended and her son is born, Hagar makes fun of his brother. He jokes in a very negative way about this old woman having a son. But for Sarah, this is the last straw. And she demands that Abraham send them both away. Hagar and her son Ismael, they had it all. Because of their attitude, they they lose it and find themselves in the desert. Uh -huh. Their supplies have run out. Yeah. And they are looking at death. Hagar could run through the scenes of her mind of how her action, her action had led her to this place. She knew that they were going to die. And she was ready to just give up right then. Even though they had blown it, God did not give up on them. Yeah. Don't miss this now. When God looked down, he did not see two dying individuals. He saw two people who were going to become a great nation. God opened Hagar's eyes to see a well of water right there in the middle of the desert. But there's someone here whose actions have led them to a very low point in their lives. And you're just about ready to give up. You would love to undo the past, but you know you can't go back and change what has happened. You could be having a hard time with someone even close to you. It might even be your fault that you find yourself where you are. But recognize that your past behavior has not canceled God's call on your life. If you would just get up and follow the word of the Lord, there's a well of water there in your desert. Just keep praying for the Lord to show you the well and know that God has not forgotten you. I don't know how long Hagar and Ishmael wandered in that desert, 
before their supplies ran out. But that wondering led them to the place where God could open her eyes to see the well. You see, God knows how long your little supplies are going to last. That little money you got in the bank. That little money you got hid under your mattress. But there are going to be time also in our life where our failure is not going to be intentional. We're going to really mean what we say. Our commitment is going to be genuine when we make it. One night Jesus was in a somewhat somber and downcast mood. As a matter of fact, it was his, it was his last night of freedom on the earth before being arrested and voluntarily giving up his life on the cross. Jesus and his alpha had eaten the last supper together. And Jesus had told him that one of them would betray him. They all wanted to know who it was. But Jesus would not tell them that it was Judas. Later that night after they had sung a hymn, they went outside. Judas was no longer with them because he had left to portray Jesus. Now it's Jesus and the faithful 11. But half the disciples recognized that Judas was no longer with them and that maybe he was the one who would be betrayed Jesus. While this thought may have been circulating through their head, Jesus makes another pronouncement. He says, tonight, every one of you will fall away because of me. In other words, he's saying, all of you, y'all going to betray me. Yes, each and every one of you. If Jesus came walking up into this poor pit and said to us all, one of you is going to betray me this week. Most of us will start thinking about who is going to do this and what awful thing is he or she going to do. But what happened if Jesus said, all of you, <laughs> all of you are going to betray me this week? What images would swirl around in your head? Or do you think immediately they might, but not me, Lord? Peter was one of the top three of Jesus' disciples. Jesus had put it out that not only was Peter in the top three, uh -huh. he will become the number one uh -huh. disciple at one point. You see, Peter tried to encourage Jesus by saying, Lord, you can count on me uh -huh. no matter what. Even if all the other guys turn their back on you, uh -huh. I never will. Yeah. Jesus didn't tell Peter, I tell you the truth. Uh -huh. This very night, before the rooster crow, you will disown me three times. You would think that would have ended the matter and the discussion, but it did not. Peter responded one more time. He said, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. His word inspired the other disciples to all say, to say the same thing. They all are making a commitment, but they do not understand all the cause that is going to be involved. When God tells us that we're going to portray him, God knows. God not only knows the future, but God knows what is in the human heart. When things do not go our way or in the way we expect them to go, it's far too easy to portray our Lord and Savior. We can take sides. We can take position. Or say things that show we are not on the Lord's side. We have to choose to not portray Christ in those situations. You see, when the chosen came, when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, all of the disciples were ready to, to fight to the death. Peter pulled out a sword uh -huh. and cut off one of the attackers' ears. Uh -huh. Jesus told him, put away your sword. Yeah. 
and stop fighting. Don't you know I could have 72,000 angels at my side right now? When he said that, the side were probably respected the angel. They expected the angel to show up right then, but they did not. Instead, Jesus reaches out his hand for them to arrest him and carry him away. The disciples did not mind going out with the fight, but they were about to voluntarily just give up their lives. They said, hey, we're out of here. They all deserted him and fled. Peter was one of the disciples that tried to mingle in with the crowd to see what's going to happen to Jesus. But having one of the top three disciples, when Jesus was popular, but began to recognize him, he was standing there trying to keep warm by the fire. But a servant girl came and said, he said, I recognize you. You were also with Jesus of Galilee. Peter tried to play it off by laughing and saying, I don't know what you're talking about. Have you ever tried to play off your faith to be a part of the crowd? He then got up and went to the gateway. But another girl saw him, D, and she said to a group, this fella was with Jesus of Nazareth. This time, Peter tried to be a little more forceful with his argument. He said, I swear on the oath, I don't know the man. Peter did not know how to keep his mouth shut because people listened closer to him as he was talking. But this time, a beautiful guy walked over to him and said, look, man, we can hear your accent from being up north. How are you going to say you do not know the man? When you are from the same place, what's the real deal here? What's really going on? But Peter's getting scared now that he's got a group coming after him. This time he goes all out. He say, if I'm lying, let that be a curse on me. My mama. And anything else I told her, I swear to you, I don't know the man. But as the word rolled off his tongue, he heard the rooster crowing, just like Jesus had said would happen. But would it be helpful if we heard the rooster crow each time that we betray Christ? My brother says, but I want you to know there is a rooster that crows. That's called the Holy Spirit. If you're walking with the Lord, when you sin, it's going to bother you spiritually. You will get a sense of remorse. You'll get a sense of guilt. If you can do wrong without feeling a need for repentance, then chances are you're not saved. We'll catch that on the way home. The moment Peter heard that rooster, he heard the words of Jesus. Before the rooster crowed, you would deny me three times. Peter went outside that gate and wept bitterly. Some of you, my brothers and sisters, you know the feeling of having the weight of what you're doing come down upon you all at once. It's a burden that gets too heavy to bear. The devil would like nothing more than for us to carry that burden in secret. The devil would like nothing more for us to do that for as long as possible to keep us from coming back to the Lord. Peter never expected to get to this place. After all, Jesus has told him he was going to be the rock upon which the church was going to be built. If you had looked at Peter at that moment, crying bitterly, Teardrops, biggest drops of rain, rolling down his face. What would you have seen? A person who was a phony? A person who was a failure? A person who could no longer be trusted? A person who was on his way back to a right relationship with God? To be equipped for the ministry 
don't miss this, of Jesus Christ to make a difference in the lives of others. Come on, y'all. When others fail, so often all we can see is the failure at that moment, especially when we never saw it coming. You see, a person point of failure is not always the best place to judge a person at. That may be more to the person than what we're looking at at that moment. But be slow to react on your anger. You see, when we fail, Jesus sees us before the failure, during the failure, and after the failure, all in the same moment of time. That is why he told Peter, Satan, Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And after you are restored, you will strengthen your brothers. Jesus was telling him not to give up. He told him not to give up. He told him that in advance. There was no disciple there when Peter denied Jesus those three times. So how do you think this story made it? into the word of God. Peter, at some point, he humbled himself before the other disciples and told them, he said, fellas, here's how I betrayed the Lord. Three times I denied knowing Jesus. Forgive me for my boasting. Forgive me for my thinking. I was somehow better than the rest of you in my faith. His repentance led to a change in his attitude uh-huh. and his action. Well, but after Jesus had died uh-huh. and had been resurrected from the dead, well, he had appeared before the disciples twice uh-huh. when they were in a house. They were supposed to go to the Galilee to wait for Jesus uh-huh. to appear there. But while waiting, they did not know what to do. So Peter said, uh-huh. I'm going fishing. <laughs> oh, Peter. He said, I'm going fishing. 600 disciples said, we'll go with you. They were going back to doing what they had done before Jesus called them to the ministry. They fished all night and caught nothing, Pastor. Jesus was on the shore, and he yelled to them, look at you. Throw your necks on the right side of the boat, and you will catch some. They did, and they caught so many fish. 153 large ones uh-huh. that the net almost broke. Yeah. Disciple John said, that ugly, I mean, that guy, uh-huh. he has to be the Lord who told us to throw our nets uh-huh. on the other side. Peter jumped into the water to be the first one to get to Jesus. But Jesus was already cooking fish for them to eat. <laughs> While they sat and had a good time eating, but there is this kind of awkwardness uh-huh. taking place. For instance, they were fishing for fish. Well, when Jesus had told them to fish for people, another question, uh-huh. who was to be in charge since Peter had failed pretty miserably? They were not even sure if Jesus fully knew what Peter had done. But as they gathered around each other, Jesus started to break the ice on the question that really people wanted to ask but did not know how to ask. Jesus looked at Peter and said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than thee? Peter brings Jesus back to the first time of them meeting together by calling him Simon, son of John. After all, it was Jesus who told him, your name is will become Peter. The name Peter meant rock. When Jesus asked, do you love me more than these? What is he asking Peter? He could be asking one of three things of all of them. Do you love me more than these men love me? Two, do you love me more than you love these men or these three? Do you love me more than the lifestyle you can get from this fishing? So if Jesus, don't miss this, was asking us this, it's going to mean something slightly different for each of us, depending on where our treasure is. How does our commitment level 
to Christ compared to others in the body of Christ. Are you faithful as a member? Or do you just show up? Does the approval and praise we get from other people mean more to us than having God's approval on our lives? Are we more interested in living in comfort than in living in Christ? Do you love Jesus more than thee? Peter wraps them all three in one and says, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lamb. Those lambs represent people who are coming to Christ that Jesus loved dearly. Jesus is instructing Peter to be responsible for them. Now you respect Jesus to then look over at John or Thomas or James and put them to the test, but he doesn't. Jesus looked again at Peter and said, Simon, son of God, son of John, do you truly love me? Can you love Jesus even when you don't feel like it? Ask yourself that. Can you love Jesus when you lost everything? Can you love Jesus when it's just you and Jesus and nobody else sees what you're doing? Can you love Jesus because you know that he died for you and without him that you have no hope? Peter was a little surprised that Jesus had come back at him again. Some of us would have said, aren't you going to ask those other guys something? Why are you picking on me? But Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. This time Jesus responds, well, take care. Take care of my sheep. He's telling Peter, you ought to be in charge of the material saints as well. You take care of them for me and watch over them. Uh -huh. Jesus then says, oh, by the way, yeah. Simon, son of John, uh -huh. do you love me? Amen. At this point, Peter took it personally that Jesus had asked him three times uh -huh. and his feelings was hurt. Yeah. He thinks, why does he not believe what I'm saying at this point? Uh -huh. At this point, some of us would have given up uh -huh. and got up and walked away in a hug. But I don't need this kind of harassment. Uh -huh. We forget that it was our own action yeah. that led us to this place that we're in. Uh -huh. Peter keeps his hurt inside with all these eyes of the other uh -huh. six staring at him. Yeah. And he said, Lord, you know all things. Yeah. You know that I love you. Uh -huh. Jesus tell him again, he said, feed my sheep. Yeah. What Jesus doing here? Uh -huh. What is he doing here? Well, he is making sure that Peter understands uh -huh. the trust and confidence that Jesus has in him. Uh -huh. Three times Peter has stood boldly and denied that he had known the Lord. Uh -huh. Three times he humbly stands and proclaims uh -huh. his love for the Lord. Yeah. But Jesus is letting the others know that he knows all about Peter, uh -huh. all about his failure. He was more interested in Peter's three affirmations uh -huh. than the failure. He also let them know that Peter is to be over the lambs and the sheep. Uh -huh. He's still going to be the rock upon which the church yeah. will be built. Amen. Jesus didn't tell Peter what his future would be, like including a death that would glorify God. Uh -huh. Peter had no idea, my brothers and sisters, yeah. that he would go through in making his commitment, uh -huh. failing in it and seeing God's plan yeah. accomplished in his life. I don't know what kind of commitment yes. you may have made to God, Amen. to yourself or to someone else, in which you fail and maybe fail misery. Uh -huh. But today may be the day your rooster is crowing, well. and it's time for you to admit it, uh -huh. so that you can begin to enter into a right relationship uh -huh. with God. You don't have to quit the faith. Uh -huh. You don't have to quit the struggle. The call is to let Jesus walk with you through it. It was painful, my brothers and sisters, for Peter to be asked these questions by Jesus. It was painful to be humble in front of the others. But nobody had any doubt that Peter had been forgiven and restored to the place God had for him. 
after that day with Jesus. But the question is, where do you need restoration today? What relationship needs mending? If you're willing to live for Jesus, there's strength available to keep you from giving up. God will do something new in your life. It comes with the prize tag of praying the prize to follow Jesus. If you're struggling with something in your life, anything, recognize that he got up to help you with your struggle. If you're hurting, remember he got up to ease your pain. If you're sick, remember he got up to heal your disease. By his stripes, you're healed. And I claim it for you. And I claim it for myself. If you worried about tomorrow, remember he got up for all our tomorrow. And there are ads today for him. If you worried about tomorrow, Remember, he got up for all our tomorrow. If you're feeling really blessed this morning, just remember we are blessed because he got up. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I thought about him last night, and I was thinking about him this morning. This is not a day that goes by that I don't think about him. You say, well, Reed, why do you spend so much time with him on your mind? Because he got up. The reason that we serve Christ. Because we plead that he rose from the dead. And is alive forevermore. We believe that when he died on the cross. He died for my sin. And he died for your sin. He died so that he would be able to live forever. In the presence of God. And the Father. I think about Jesus. Because he had got up. I would not be standing before you this morning. You see, I know for myself that he got up. I heard about it, and then he revealed himself to me. You see, I'm a believer. I can lose everything that I own and every person that I care about, but that will not stop me from being a believer. Why? Because he got up. He got up, and because he got up, I can do everything that I must in order to do what he has called me to do. Because he got up, I am more than what you see standing before you. Because he got up, you are more than what I see sitting before me. Your failures has been forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Your hurt, although the pain might still be present, or going to be eased. Everything you face can face. You can face with confidence that he got up. So from this day forward, when someone asks you, why you serve him? Just tell him. Because he got up. When they ask you how can you smile. In the midst of pain. Tell them. Because he got up. When they ask you how you make it through. Tell them. Because he got up. When they call and tell your dad I got cancer. What do you tell him? It's okay. Because he got up. When it looks like all hope is gone. And your friends are worried about you. Tell them you're going to be okay. Why? Because he got up. You're not, your life is not your own. Because he got up. There's more to you than you know. Because he got up. Accept him this morning. And allow him to reveal himself to you. May God forever bless and keep you. Is my desire. And my, my prayer. For what he has done on the inside. 